Okay, so I'm going to zoom in on my announcements so you can see them a little bit better. Um, but just as a reminder, there's homework due tomorrow night. There's three assignments. Uh, there's the last trig assignment, and then there are two new assignments from the exponential section. Um, and here's the sort of the upcoming schedule over the next week. Um, so today, the thing you should have watched is a new video about exponentials. I'm happy to answer questions about that one. But since we have our test next week, right, our test is going to be next Thursday. Uh, over the next week. Your screen's all blurry. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, let me double check that. Looks fine on mine, my end. Let me see here. Is anyone else having that issue? It's a little blurry, but uh, I can I can read it still. It's not too blurry to read. It could be um, computer to computer. I usually have. I'm actually going to log in on another computer. I try to have a second computer on so I can see what what it looks like. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. And sometimes on that computer, it does look a little blurry for some reason. Like it'll be clear on my computer, but blurry on the one right next to me. Um, uh, oh, that's because default um, Google Meet will um, send your video in um, in 360p, which is like a kind of a low resolution. But you can, you can go into the settings and tell it to stream in 720p. Oh, that's a great tip. So maybe if everyone, um, I'm going to share my screen right now just so everyone knows what uh, I think that was Zach was talking about. It's going to look kind of crazy because I'm going to share my screen and my own screen. I think that does like a weird yeah. zoom it in. It just does thing, that by but... default, I think, because if some people like, have like a really bad internet connection, they might not be able to see it. Or if like a bunch of people are sharing their screen in 720p all at the same time. Good point. Yeah. So the other thing is, but if you it's know, just going to be you, it should be fine if you're doing 720p. If anyone has their camera on, turning it off will help that. But I don't think anyone does. And what Zach's saying, if you go to settings, like I'm doing right now on my screen, and then if you go to video, the send resolution or receive resolution, you want to change the receive to 720. That'll clear things up if it's blurry for you. But that's going to require sort of better internet or whatever. So if it's slow, if your internet's like skipping or something, or you have slow internet then you might want to go back to 360. Uh, thanks for mentioning that, Zach. All right, I'm going to stop presenting. Uh, I hope that helped you. It looks good on my other computer, too, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, so what I was just saying is we have our test next Thursday, and so we're moving into new material that's not on the test, right? So the test is just on trig, but we're starting exponentials and logs today. So exponentials is today. Logarithms is the video for Thursday. And so as we go and talk about those new sections, I'm happy to keep talking about trig, right? So you should be starting to prepare for the trig test while we move into the new material. And so if you have questions about the trig as we keep going, by all means, ask it. Uh, I also want to point out that Monday is uh, Patriots Day. And so we don't, you know, we, we weren't supposed to have class on our schedule. And so I'm not going to assign a video for that day. But I am going to come on during this normal time to see if there are questions. Uh, so again, as you're preparing for the test, if you run into some questions or you're having trouble with the homework or whatever, I'll be available on Monday for questions, just like normal. But again, there's no, there's no, nothing assigned for Monday. Um, and then we will do a full-on review day on Tuesday. We can spend the entire day um, on Tuesday for review. And so as you start studying, please send me things that you want to talk about, specific questions or um, anything. That, that you're interested in, in talking about. And I'm just realizing I just stuttered here because on the schedule, I accidentally thought said it was on Wednesday, but it should be on Tuesday. So it'll be on Tuesday, we'll do that full review day. Uh, and then we'll do our, and that, that review day is a mandatory day because we're gonna do a little dry run of the test, by the way. Um, and we'll do the test on Thursday from, from our own houses. Um, again, more on that. I have my test in my linear algebra class tomorrow, as I've mentioned, so we'll see how that goes. And I'll, I'll sort of talk to you Thursday more about how that went and uh, get you some details. Um, let's not also forget that the tutors are available. So in addition to the general tutor center, there are our pre-cal tutors are still around. Um, they're meeting on Google Meet every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. So please keep that in mind. Okay, so I do have some trig questions. I'm going to start with the trig questions because um, this is more immediate. And then if people have questions about exponentials, we can we can talk about those as well. 
Uh, so I had three questions about the solving trig equations homework. And so this is solving trig equations problem number five. And so we're being given this equation. Let me just write, rewrite the equation down. It's cosine x sine x minus 2 cosine equals 0. And we're being told the answer is going to look like this. And we just want to be able to write down what a and b are. Is that a little bit too bright? I mean, let me turn my lights down. Is that too dark? I don't know. I'll stick with that. Um, so anyway, you can see here it says hint factor the expression. And so this looks like one of the factoring kind of problems from the notes. Uh, just to be clear, there's only two pages on solving trig equations. And all of them do look something like one of the things in the notes. So I just want to point out kind of the notes really quickly to make you feel a little better about notes and what's in there. Although my notes are now all out of order because I keep messing around with them. So maybe I, lost, I just lost it. Oh, here we go. Uh, so this one's kind of similar to maybe these factoring expressions right here. Now these ones had a square in it, so they're slightly different, but we did factor some things in those two equations. And so we're gonna wanna do something similar to that on this one because we're being told to factor, right? And so you can see that there's two cosines. There's a cosine and a cosine. And so you can factor out the cosine to get this. Does that seem okay to folks? And so then you have two things being multiplied. You have cosine multiplying this sine x minus 2, and you want that to be 0. And so then you set them equal to 0 separately. So cosine equals 0, or sine minus 2 equals 0. And then you just solve those two things separately. But one of them runs into a dead end, because when you try to solve the sine one, right, when you add 2 to both sides to get sine by itself, you think, where is sine equal to 2? Right, and so the biggest y value on the unit circle is one. And so we're thinking this is some y value and the largest y value on the unit circle is y equals one. And so we actually don't get an answer. We get a does not exist or no solution or something like that for this piece. Just this one side, okay? We do get an answer for the other side, but from this one piece, we don't get anything. Um, from the other piece, cosine equaling zero, we do get an answer. And so this is an x value on the unit circle because we're talking about cosine, right? Cosine is the x value. And so on the unit circle, the x value is zero right here. But <clears throat> uh, right here and also right here, All right? That's the point zero minus one and zero one. And so the x value is zero in both of them. Let me just stop right there. I don't want to rush through this one too much. Usually, you know, when we're in class, I can like kind of look out and see whether people are writing or people looking confused. And, and I, it's very strange not being able to, to see that here. Um, so anyway, can I, I'm just going to pause and see if we're okay so far. We haven't written down the solution, but we're, we're really close to. I figured out where the solutions exist. They exist on those two points. And is it, is it clear why we're thinking about those two points? That's the important part of these problems. You know, on the test, if I ask you for one of these and you get this far, you're going to get most of the points. Uh, writing the final answer is obviously part of it, but this is like the big, usually confusing part. So anyway, I'll stop again and see if there's a question so far. Now that I see it, it's pi over 2, right? Is the is for A, right? Yeah, so... Uh, but why why do we only get one thing, right? So first of all, like Sean said, this is pi over 2 right here. And then this one is 3 pi over 2. And so what is the answer? Like, it, the answer is supposed to be just a plus bk, bk pi. That, that's what we're being told the answer looks like. And so what is it, Sean? I think I got one for that because it, uh, from the interval, it's 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 between zero and a is between zero and pi and pi and pi is just one right so it's no greater than ah 
so here's here's how we're thinking about it. We want to be on the on one of those two places. These two places are directly across from each other on the unit circle, right? In other words, if I walked along the outside of the unit circle between them, how far is that distance? How far is half the unit circle? Yeah. This is a pi, right? It's no. pi, right? Pi. So if, if I start at pi over 2 and then I add pi to it, it takes me to 3 pi over 2. And then if I add pi to that, it takes me back to the other spot. And so all we need to do when the points are directly across from each other is add pi. And so this one is pi over 2 plus just 1 pi k because the points are directly opposite each other. In the notes, we talked about this on the top of the second page where we said, hey, look, these two points are directly across from each other that we want to be at. And so when we write it, we, uh, when we write it, when we wrote our answer down, we added a pi k. In other words, even though there's two points, you don't need to write down two separate things because adding pi k bounces you back and forth between those two points. But you can only do that if they're directly across from each other, right? So on one like this, for example, this one right here, these are also two points that are solutions to this problem, but they're not directly across from each other. And so when we wrote this answer down, we needed to write them down separately with a 2 pi k, because the 2 pi sends you all the way back around to the same point. That's, this is one of the very key things in this section is when do you add a pi k and when do you add a 2 pi k? And what I'm saying here is you do pi k with just one solution if the points are directly across from each other, and you do 2 pi k with two solutions if the points are not across from each other. Um, and so in this problem, kind of coming back to this one, the a is pi over 2 and then the b is just 1. All right, I'm going to stop you right there. A question. Yep, go ahead. And you mentioned uh, add 2 pi. It's because we take one of the points and we just add a pi. We're either going to land on some point before or after the other coordinate, correct? Which is why we only add a pi to say this problem that you show on the screen because we go directly to that coordinate, not before it, not after it. That's right, yeah. So if there's just one point, like, um, let me just do a hypothetical problem here where there's just one point we want to be. So here's a unit circle. Let's say we just want to be at pi over 4. Let's just pretend that's the only answer. Then the solution would be pi over 4, which would put us right there, or any multiple of that. When you do the 2 pi, it puts you right there, but then it sends you all the way back around to the same exact spot. And so that's how it would be with just one point, right? And then just like you said, if there's another point that's not directly across from it, like say seven pi over four, then you would also have to add a second one for that, right? Because this first solution is never gonna hit this one. And this second solution is never gonna hit the first one. That's why you have to do them separately. But if they're directly across from each other and you add pi, it will hit them. So it sounds like you, you understand what's going on. I'm just trying to reiterate, reiterate this. Other thoughts about uh, this one? I've got two more to look at. Uh, someone asked about 9 and 10, so we can look at that one, those two as well. Okay, let me put up uh, 9. So 9 was asked about, which looks like, oops, which looks like this. Um... <clears throat> okay. And so this is another factoring one, it looks like, and it does say hint, factor the expression. Um, and I just sort of knew it was a factoring one before seeing that because it had a square in it, right? And so if we have like a, a, a quadratic kind of looking thing, it looks like um, it's usually going to be a factoring problem. Um, I'm actually just looking at this one online, and it looks like maybe there's an error with it. Is anyone else getting an error when they try to open that problem? Give me one second here.
For some reason, it's saying there's no answer recorded. Same thing with number 10. Very strange. Oh. Okay, I think part of the confusing thing on this problem is how you enter the answer. So let's solve it first and then we'll figure out how to enter the answer. I think that's what's confusing me right now at least. So anyway, it wants us to factor it. Hopefully you can see that we've got two cosine squared minus cosine minus one. So this is kind of like two X squared minus X minus one. So you wanna think about it like a quadratic and factor it. Uh, and again, there are two like this in the notes. It actually looks very similar to this one with, with this cosine here. Um, so it's kind of like that one. Anyway, let's factor this one. If we think about it like an X, then that's gonna factor, I'm gonna do like the guess and check method here and see if I can figure this out. We need, um, let's see, we're probably a minus one and a plus one, does that work? You get a two X squared minus two X plus X minus one. Yeah, so that's what the, that would factor into. But our X in this case, is cosine of t. And so when we factor ours, it's going to factor into 2 cosine t plus 1 cosine t minus 1. Uh, it equals 0, too, I forgot. So that's usually one of the trickier parts. And so let me just pause there and see if people are following so far. Because once you, if you kind of understand how these problems work and you understand how to solve equations, Usually getting to this step is like the hard part. Um, so let me see if that makes sense. And so in that case, we've got two things being multiplied and they're set equal to zero. And so we set them equal to zero separately. So we do two cosine plus one equals zero just like we did in the last one, right? You break it up to cosine minus one equals zero. And then you solve them separately. So this is gonna be cosine is minus one half when you do that one, or cosine equals one. Uh, Dr. Should that be two cosine minus one? Because it's, because the problem, the equation says two cosine square minus, and then the factoring. If you look, are, uh, I'm sorry. I think this is correct. So when you multiply this, the, my factored part out, the two cosine times the cosine gives you two cosine squared. And then you'd have two cosine times minus one, which would be minus two plus one gives you the minus one. Oh, my bad. I see it. My bad. I and then the, the plus and minus one give you the minus one. Yeah, I think this looks okay. That's fine. That's all right. Uh, other clarificational things? That's, I'm happy you're, you're thinking about it and trying to work it through. That's good. Other folks seem okay? Right, and so these are x values because we're talking about cosine. Cosine is the x values, right? Box number one. And so when we're, we're trying to think about where is the x value either minus one half or one? Anyone? Like some help with that. Where is either the co the x value minus one half or one on the unit circle? I over four. So it'd be um, the opposite end. So it'd be on the second quadrant. So pi over four has square root of two over two in both spots. So it's not a pi over four. Oh wait, no, it's be pi over three. It's pi over three. Yeah, good. So it's pi over. Th oh, but it's got to be negative, right? So it's got to be the Here's one over five. here. So 2 pi over 3, or what? What's what's another one? The one that's down here. 5 pi over 3? Or 4, pi. Uh, 4 pi over 3. So 5 pi over 3 would be the one that's over here. Uh, okay, so we want to be at one of those two places. Again, that's because the x value is minus 1 half at both of those. I'm writing down the x comma y. But the point is, they both have minus one halves, which is what we were looking for. And then where is the x value one? 
one in, at quadrant one and four. There's uh, only one place on the unit circle where the x value is one. Uh, would that be just a quad at one? It's not, well, it's on an axis. Oh, at 2 pi. Yeah, right at the zero spot, right? So at zero or 2 pi, the point is 1, comma, 0. So we want to be at one of those three spots is what we're looking for here. You with me so far? Is everyone okay? So this spe specific question is saying, solve the equation for every possible value on the interval zero to two pi. So it doesn't want us to do the funky, uh, you know, plus two pi k thing or anything. It just wants us to list all the solutions between zero and two pi. And so the solutions, those are them, right? So the solutions between zero and two pi are zero pi, 2 pi over 3, 4 pi over 3, and 2 pi. But notice the way it wants it entered, it's including the pi. It's like it doesn't want you to enter the pi part, and it talks about this in the, the problem. It says, like, if you want to enter pi over 2, don't put the pi part in. Just enter 1 half instead. And so we would enter, the, the thing you'd enter in the box would be, Zero, two thirds, four thirds, two. That goes in the box, and it's because there's like a pi outside of it. Gonna just wait here, see if people wanna write that one down, see if I can answer a question about it before we look at uh, the next one. I'm also going to check that answer to see if that's right. Uh, I did not. Oh, whoops, I entered the wrong thing. That's why. Yep, okay, enter that in. Looks good. Clarify something about that one? Okay, let's look at the next one. This is the last question I had, but I'm, I'm happy to answer other ones if other people want to talk, or if you have questions about exponentials, that'd be good too. But let's look at this one first. So uh, I messed up when I was printing this one. I unplugged my printer before I finished. But anyway, so this is problem 10, and this is the problem. It says sine squared equals 1 half. So we want to get sine by itself, right? And so we take a square root. And when you square root both sides, the square goes away on the left, but you get plus or minus on the right, right? And this is plus or minus square root of one over square root of two. And we know that the square root of one is just one. And so this is plus or minus one over root two. Oh, I know that this one's particularly tricky. Um, and so I'm glad we're doing this one together. Plus or minus, 1 over root 2 is the same thing as plus or minus root 2 over 2. And we didn't, we sort of briefly talked about rationalization of denominators, but we didn't officially talk about it in terms of a topic. So anyway, this is what we want to be solving here. We want to be solving sine of t equals plus or minus root 2 over 2. All right, we're solving that. So that, again, that's a tricky part of this one because we had to get sine by itself. And we had to realize that 1 over root 2 is the same thing as root 2 over 2. So that was tricky about that. Can I clarify something about, about that so far before we think about where we're, we're looking for it on the unit circle? Okay, so this is a y value. Where are the y values plus or minus root 2 over 2? This is what Cameron had said before. I think it was Cameron. Pi over four, right? Yeah, all the pi over four places. 
So pi over 4 would be root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. Uh, 3 pi over 4, because that one is minus root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. That uh, would be 5 pi over 4, and also 7 pi over 4. Right, all the pi over 4 places have y values with root 2 over 2s. And so this is just like the last one. It wants all the ones on 0 to 2 pi. And so we write down all the solutions from 0 to 2 pi. And those are all the ones listed right here. And so it's pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4. And it wants us to enter it the same way. Again, I didn't print it out. But it wants you to just take the pi out. And so you just do 1 fourth. 3 fourths, 5 fourths, 7 fourths. That's what goes in the box. And then the pi is like out front next to it. So, you know, you should definitely expect to see some of these solving equations problems. This is the culmination of a lot of the trig stuff, right? Ultimately, when you the, the reason you're taking this class, a lot of people end up taking this course, pre-calculus, is because your your major wants you to have some sort of trig. And it's usually because of either SOHCAHTOA things and or solving trig equations, because trig comes up in lots of other subjects. So anyway, it's kind of a culmination of that, because if you see this in another course, your professor and your major might expect that you know how to solve an equation. And so we want to be able to do that. Um, thoughts about this one right here, number 10? Are there other trig questions? Do people have anything they want to talk about related to exponentials? So exponentials and logs... Um, is going to take us almost to the end of the semester. I still haven't quite rounded out the last week, I don't think, yet in our schedule, but we're right at the edge here. If someone about to ask a question, I'll just stop for a second. On page 81 for exponential applications, you had stated that, like, the equation that you wrote, so W of T, F of T, B of T, yep. is a number times uh, a, number, a number with a decimal. So B in town was B of T equals 29,000 times 1.6 to the power of t. Um, you kept stating in the video that the 1.6 to the power of t was our a value, which kept confusing me, which I don't know why, because if you look at the equation of the previous page, y equals a of x. Well, a, a x squared, rather. Do you mean on page 78, <clears throat> this one? Yeah. Yeah, so the base, right, so the base a is the thing that's being raised to the x to the variable i mean and so this is that that's why the a is 0.65 right if you got rid of the 10,000 for example the thing being raised to the variable power is 0.65 um and then the thing out in front is just multiplying it and so this is vertically stretching this exponential graph because you're multiplying the graph on the outside by something bigger than 1 and so this is the actual exponential part, 0.65 to the t, and the 10,000 or the 29,000 is like a coefficient that's multiplying the exponential. Okay, and then with the vertical shift, you can have it a, a number like say plus one. So get rid of the 10,000. You can add vertical shift on the left side or the right side of the say 0.65 t. Could you do the same for uh, the, the 10,000? Could you put it on the left or the right side? And it'd be the same application. Yeah, 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 sure. So, so in other words, if you had like a to the x, if you multiplied that by something, you could do c a to the x, and that's the same thing as a to the x times c. Uh, in other words, you can change the order of multiplication, or you can take an, a function and add something to it, and that would be the same as this. So, yes. Thank you. Um, let me also just mention another reason that oftentimes people take this course or majors require people to take this course is because of exponentials and or logs. Um, especially, I know for a fact, like ecology courses down the line, you, you model 
uh, lots of things in ecology and in biology using functions that look like this, which are exponentials. And so I know for a fact, like in, jo in uh, Dr. Ludlum, John Ludlum's future upper level ecology courses, you like solve these kind of exponential equations when you're talking about bacteria or sometimes um, like rabbits or certain animals that, that populate really quickly. I mean, it's never really been a better time in pre-calculus to talk about these curves too with the whole coronavirus thing, right? There's curves like this that are on the news like every single night talking about how coronavirus is going through exponential growth. And so this section on exponential functions has never been more relevant. And I really hope that you take a second and, and try to understand that stuff. It's not challenging and it's really, really highly applicable to your actual everyday life right now. Um, and so let me just maybe summarize really quick what it says in this section. Exponentials are some number raised to the power of X. So the variable is in the exponent. And if you have the number raised to the power bigger than one, the thing goes up, the exponential goes up. And if the base of the function is between zero and one, so a fraction, it goes down. And so this section is all about manipulating that function using, uh, using transformations, just like we did with all the other transformation things. And then talking about like plugging numbers in, and um, there's like we just looked at in this this thing right here. There's this exponential section talking about uh, population growth. I've been thinking a lot about making this section talk about disease spread throughout this whole thing. I, I think it would make it more relevant. But anyway, we could say that these things represent like the growth of disease in the in a city too, instead of the population, and maybe that's more relevant. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to sort of mention that. And then the thing that you're going to study for for Thursday is logarithms. And the key thing with logarithms is that they are the inverse of exponentials. And so just to preview the video for Thursday, anytime you have an exponential, you can rewrite that as a logarithm because they're inverses. And so that's why they're highly related to each other. Anyway, I won't go into more of that right now. Can I answer some other questions about exponentials or, or logs if you want anything uh, or really anything else on your mind today from the notes or the homework that you'd like to look at? Okay, well, if not, I'm around. Please, uh, please do reach out. Thank you very much for coming. I'm going to post this video on YouTube.